Welcome to my latest podcast. I'm in Concordia in New York City today. Tom Brokaw, who is well-known, distinguished journalist, is a legend in the broadcasting business, needs no other introduction. And my other guest today is Michael Crow, president of Arizona State University. Uh, president Crow has had many uh, awards given to him as a leading uh, uh, college president. Okay, today, Tom Brokaw, Michael Crow, ASU, Arizona State University president, Tom Brokaw, how to identify you? You're everything. <laughs> yeah, you well, are. Remember, too. Well, they call me uh, at NBC, the, the time we had a hard time once I left Nightly News, uh, and I said, well, what about the old guy? And they said, no, we're going to call you special correspondent. So you remember, I probably, is that what you are now, special? Yeah, I'm really special. <laughs> they, yeah, but you know, you, you do. Yeah. You have a great. You've had a great life. I have. I mean, you grew up. You were born in South Dakota. I was. And right. now you have a ranch in Montana. Right. And you hunt all over the world. But I, not all over the world. I, you know, I'm a bird hunter primarily. Yeah, and, and that's what brings us together. Right. Because I too am a bird right. hunter. But I've never gotten off to go to all the places that you've gone. To, well, I, some of you wouldn't want to be there. I mean, you know, I was in Afghanistan with special forces. I was in Iraq early before the war. Well, began. you weren't shooting birds, so I'm. No, I wasn't about. shooting birds. No, <laughs> but I did shoot birds last year in uh, in Africa, and I must say uh, that was uh, exhilarating. Um, there's a, you know, it's very tough out there. You know, there are a lot of birds. I've hunted birds in Africa. Yeah, I mean, they, you know what it's like. Yeah. Oh, that, the bird that comes in at dusk, you know, and goes to the water. Yeah, I remember that bird, and it's a foo bird. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, how did you two guys hook up? Well, I, I met Michael originally because I was on the board of the Mayo Clinic, and we have a facility in Arizona in Scottsdale. And Michael, typically of his entrepreneurial ways, came to us and said, I want to build a medical school at Arizona State because the University of Arizona won't share theirs with us, and I'd like you to run it. And that's how we all met. That's just like OU and Oklahoma State. Same thing. <laughs> exactly. Same thing. They won't share with us either. <laughs> so here's what happened. And then I started making a speech around the country about what I thought was a desperate need for new forms of public service for young people. The millennials are extremely gifted. These young people coming along now, but they don't feel a connection to the institutions or the country or to the government because they've been burned by it or they've seen their parents burned by it so much. So I made this passionate speech. He came to me and I said, I'm your guy. We can do something about this at Arizona State. It was typical of him. So they've created a public service academy at Arizona State. Last year, 100 students. This year, 250. Next year, it'll be 500. Well, we hope. Well, we're going into 600, and so it's the idea that, that Tom came up with was he said, can, this, can the public universities, the big state universities, help us get uh, national service leadership off the ground rather than just talking about it? Can't we get some of these schools to step up and build some academies? We have Annapolis. We have West Point. We've got other things like that. We've got ROTC. We don't have anything that helps produce the kind of leaders that uh, national service really asks for outside of the military. So we took this idea and said, we'll get it going, pilot it, then we'll get a bunch of other schools to get it going. And you did? We have, yeah. yeah. We're underway. Okay, so you've been at it, what, two years? Well, we got it launched. We have two, two classes in place. We're going to have 600 students, full scholarships for everyone that we've uh, put in place. We've got Everybody's on a full ride. Everybody, yep. Yeah. Full ride, what does that mean? It means covers your costs of attendance. I know. What's it mean in dollars? Uh, if you're out of state, it's uh, approaching 35000 If you're in state, it's half of that. So we're looking for help. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're funding this on the go at this point. Mike, you don't want money from me. <laughs> well, I'm too old. If you've got a little change, that would be helpful. Just think about the, you know, about the Boone Scholarship Program at Arizona State. Listen, the other thing is, one of the reasons I came up with this is that I have felt for some time that it's immoral for a democratic society to spend, send less than 1% of its population into harm's way as military people. Our military is made up of less than 1% of our population, working class kids, kids who come out of Texas, small towns, in my part of the country, in South Dakota and Montana, because they don't have a lot of other opportunities, and they're also very patriotic. So how do you spread the... What do you think, draft? No, I don't... I, the, the military will not go back to the draft, because they like them motivated. 
But what I do think is that you then raise the role of civilians, so they're making some sacrifices and making contributions as well. They're not just getting shot at. The way that this came to me is I have beyond these villages in Iraq and Afghanistan with the military units, special forces. They'd go in and they'd have to you know, repair the power plants and build a medical facility, but they were heavily armed and they had to be, and they'd have to shake down the, the white pickup trucks in town. And there was a lot of kind of tension between the villagers and the military people. I thought if you had something in between, mm -hmm. American civilians who would come in protected by the military, and then they would be specialists in various areas. And then that would put a different face on America. So that's another, another angle. So we have the kids training side by side with our ROTC groups, Air Force, uh, Army, and Navy. So you do, you, we, our civilians in our National Service Corps inside the Public Service Academy train side by side our ROTC students. And then that gives a, a back and forth between both groups. Because as we found in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, it's not just defeating the enemy. There's, in a sense, making things work. Uh, and so that's been the second part of what we've been doing. Do you believe that we're going to stay in Afghanistan and Mideast? What does stay mean? I mean, we're in and out of it, in and out of there. Well, Afghanistan for 2,000 years has never really been a complete state. It's no. A, it's a collection of tribes. It's fantastic countryside, if you love that kind of thing, which I do. But these are people <coughs> who have spent generations worrying about just their village and their tribal culture and their tribal way of life. And staying alive. And staying alive. Yeah. And I would say, I'd go on with the uh, with patrols, and we'd go into these little mud hut villages, and then the Americans would go, and these terrific young captains and majors who were here to help and want to build things. I could see these merchants who had a few aluminum pans and so on, and that was about it. They would look skeptically, and I'd let the military guys go on. I'd take the interpreter, and I'd say, what do you think? they almost always say some variation of this, we don't need more people with guns telling us what to do in our own country. Right. And boy, that's a huge hurdle to get over, frankly. No, no kidding. I, you know, I watched that from a distance, fortunately, that I, that I too old to serve as military, but I, I've, uh, I've watched the Afghan deal. I mean, it uh, first was the Brits, wasn't it? And it yeah. Then it was the Russians. And then, yeah, I mean, it was uh, going and, on forever. Yeah, it, it has. But let me ask you one yeah. that is, I think, out in front of all of us now. Uh, do we want to have free college for everybody? Here's what I, I don't know what Michael thinks, but I, I'm going to twin up what we've got. I believe. And I hope that she gets asked this at some point. She took the idea from Bernie Sanders. I know, but I days of mail she took too. <laughs> and here's what I believe. I think that there's an opportunity here to say to families that make $125,000 a year or whatever the number that they decide on, that you've got college age and eligible uh, children. We're gonna get them through four years and you're gonna give us back two or three years as public servants. And that ties into what? Yeah. Absolutely. What, what I would say is that is that nothing nothing is free, and so the big the big problem in the United States. That is to, that is so true. Excuse yes. me for interrupting, yeah. but nothing is free. Not, there's there's not, no there's free a, lunch. So free, I mean, so, free, so free itself no. free itself is a is a overused word that doesn't describe the objective. So so right now we've got a, a huge problem in American college education, and it's not access as much as completion. So more than half the people that have ever started a college program in the U.S. have no degree at all. They never finished. Half the people that have gotten a Pell Grant from the government, half a trillion dollars of expenditures, have no degree and no certificate. So the problem is how to help kids to be able to finish and then how to make sure there are no financial barriers. You can do both of those things and not call it free. Well, those, you say that they did not graduate, right? right. <clears throat> but you didn't, the public didn't pay them for those people, did they? They did. They did? Yes. Yeah. So that you're saying that they were... It's, in, it's, it's, it's right now what we have That's is we, why you can't pay off the debt. Well, no, the debt thing is different. The debt, the debt thing's more, more complicated. So the, when, you, when you don't graduate and you have debt, it looks pretty bad in terms of being able to pay it back. If you well, graduate... Well, I mean, that debt yeah. is, is, is probably not going to be paid back. Well, I think a lot of it's paid back, but it's painfully paid back. And so what you need to do is figure out how to get kids to to finish college, and then you need to make sure that there's no financial barrier uh, that's artificial. Everybody's got to work, everybody should pull their own weight, everybody should have skin in the game and make it work. And so what we need is a much more 
effective system of higher education, not what we have now. Well, Michael, I, I felt like that, that the counselors uh, for a, a high school student that, and what I've said, and I've talked to a lot of young people, I say, listen, that college isn't for everybody. Yeah, I, I think there's something to that, by the way. I think that we ought to have more emphasis on community colleges and on technical schools. We're always going to need welders. We're always going to need electricians. We're always going to need, I work with technical people at NBC all day, every day. They're the wizards who get me on the air. I don't understand. People ask me, how do you get that picture from where you are to where I am? I always say it's a you miracle. You have no idea. It's a miracle. <laughs> you know, I don't well, know. you show up for your part. Right. Yeah, so, but, but so, so one of the things, though, is, is that, no, college is not for everyone. But what I'll say is they used to say that about high school. They used to say that about reading. They used to say that about, about a lot of things. And so I'm not, I'm, I'm not here to say college is for everyone, but I am here to say learning is for everybody. But so let, me, let me add one point, and that is that since 2007, the beginning of the recession, uh, the number of jobs available in the United States economy for people with only a high school diploma or less is down by 20%. The number of jobs is down by 20% in that educational category. And so what's happened is that there's been a, a shift in the nature of what employers want, not uniformly across the board, but it, there's an increasing need to have people learning how to learn more, learning how to adjust more, learning how to adapt better to the things that they confront because now it's not one career and two jobs in your life, it's four careers and 12 jobs going forward. But, you know, I, uh, I'm, uh, all I have is an undergraduate degree. Yep. You, that's, that's all, all you I have. have. What? Yeah, and, and so I didn't, uh, but I was there. And I knew what I was there for. Yeah. I was in there, geologist, yeah. out in yeah. four years, went to work as a geologist. You know, I fit the program perfect. Yeah. But a lot of these kids, they don't know what, for sure what they're going to do when they get to college. Right. Right. Then they get there, and yeah. then they get a degree. Yeah. And there's a lot of degrees that you come out of college with for that particular uh, discipline. You, there are no jobs. Yeah, the unemployment rate for college graduates right now is, is uh, under 3%. And so, but there, what's happening is that a lot of the jobs are not in the field that they studied per se, but it's not so much what's going on now, it's what's going on later when they're 35 or 40 or 45. Did college prepare them to learn more quickly, to learn more broadly? Does it help them and to do be... And you think it did? Well, that, if it didn't, then there's, there's something wrong at the college. Well, uh, today, I mean, you get out of college with with a petroleum engineering degree, mm -hmm. well, you'll get a job. Yes. Or mechanical engineering or geology. Well, almost everybody gets a job. They don't always get the job they want. But they do in those disciplines. They, they, yeah. They're able to. Yeah, get so it. the return on investment for an engineering degree over your life is over 20% per year. Well, what he's also saying, though, Boone, is that whatever their particular major is or discipline is, that college uh, expands the mind and, exp and expands the learning curve so that they learn how to learn yeah. when they're in college. Yeah. yeah, they don't have to get out and go to work. Right, I mean, yeah, right. Right, right. In, in a particular field. Look, I mean, I, I've spent the last three years deep in the American healthcare field because of my own personal condition. The great jobs in healthcare in America, but they really require a highly disciplined mental approach to it as well, whether it's just a nurse who's going to, you know, uh, who's going to take your blood and, 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 and read your blood pressure. She has to be somebody who can be quick, nimbly, uh, mentally, and her nurse's training helps her do that. So all these things raise the level, I think, in this country. Well, nursing is a perfect example. So nursing is a technical skill that doesn't require a college degree per se, but everybody wants to hire RNs who also have a degree called BSN, Bachelor of Science in Nursing, because that person with the BSN is better in their uh, personal relationships with patients, is able to learn more things, do more things, adjust more quickly. And so it's a foundational educational platform, just like reading became a foundational educational platform. Well, it's okay, but let's go back to the question where yeah. I know you guys are tied on time, but yeah. the, the question, uh, what are we gonna do? Uh, the, uh, is college education free? No free lunches, we agreed on that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, we have these politicians getting up and saying, you know, that we're going to make college free for you. Who in the hell is going to pay for So it? we did a project with uh, Starbucks that we launched a year and a half ago. We have 6,000 students in it. 
And so what we said is we're going to take, they have 70,000 of their partners, that's what they call their employees, that started college in the United States and didn't finish. We said between Starbucks and ASU that we'd produce 25,000 college graduates at, essentially with no debt and no cost to those students by a joint investment, the investment of Starbucks, the investment of us, the investment of other financial aid resources, because what we're trying to go back in and do is help those students to complete. So it's college completion. We got millions and millions and millions of people that started college and never finished, and they're very upset and very angry, as they should be. That well, are we going to go back in and fund them? Is that what I don't know. I, no, what I'd say is that there's, way, there's ways using new techniques and new technologies to pick up these people and you move them need, forward. And you don't need bricks and mortar or right. whatever. You, it's online education. You know, they, everybody's got a phone or an iPad at, at that what? room. And so they can go to school on those instruments. See, I don't think that, that if I went to school today, I, I think that I would not spend four years on a campus. Yeah. Yeah. No, you wouldn't have. You'd have been working and getting your degree while you're out there going around west the Permian Basin trying to find the next oil. Well, and, and now you wouldn't have to. So, so we changed at ASU. We changed the nature of our semester. We now have academic modules we have uh, that are faster. You can spend half the semester away in the field working on projects. We now you can. We'll fund your company inside the university. You incubate it while you're a student. You work for half a semester on your classwork, half a semester on your company, you move forward in different ways. What we've done is we've tried to work to restructure the way college operates so that you can capture the totality of the way that a person really needs to learn. How big is ASU now? How many students? We have 73,000 on-campus full immersion students, 25,000 online full digital immersion students, and then an additional 200,000 individuals taking at least one course online with us. How big will it? ASU, how, how big can it? You know, I don't know. I, I'd say there are physical limits in terms of the face-to-face -face programs. There are no limits relative to the online programs. No limit on online, but not on not campus. On, we... on campus, 100,000, something like that, maybe a little more than that. We have, we have uh, five academic campuses in Metro Phoenix that we operate as a single institution, as we don't have campus administration, we've restructured everything, we've eliminated 80 academic units, restructured programs, changed our cost basis, uh, lowered our cost to the state to produce a degree by a factor of four, uh, a range of things that we've done. Yeah, if you go there, and I hope that you will visit at some point, I was there at commencement a few years ago, Phil Sun Devil Stadium for commencement, by the way. I was there. Were you? Not the same year, but my granddaughter. Yeah, great. right. And so I you was saw there for was like. in the yeah. Sun Devil Stadium. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then when they ask them, the parents, how many of you in the parents section are having your first child graduating from college? A lot of hands go up. And then you ask the student body, how many of you have worked part-time? A majority go up. How many of you work full-time? A hell of a lot of them say, I had to work full-time to get my degree. Sure. Uh, and then how many veterans do you have there now? Thousands. Yeah. Thousands of veterans. Thousands of veterans are going there. The elite Ivy League schools, Princeton, 20 veterans. Arizona State, thousands. So, I mean, these are important state institutions. Oh, uh, well, we, well, we think of ourselves now as a national service university. We're, we, are, we are obviously a part of the great state of Arizona, but we're in service to the state and we're in service to the people, but we're really in service to the nation. You know, what, what is it that we can do to help the United States to be more economically competitive, more democratically uh, uh, capable, uh, help us through all of the stresses and the strains that we're going through? The second you change the mindset of the university faculty and the university leadership to that's our mission, everything changes. And we did that. And we successfully have navigated that, that, that process. That was not easy. No. What is easy? Nothing you've done has ever been easy. <laughs> Getting oil not, out of the ground isn't easy. It is. It is it's harder <laughs> to find it. But th that's changed a lot yeah. because of some things. Well, we've uh, been a – thanks for coming on my podcast. Yeah. You'll get plenty of coverage, not as much as you get, but, but Michael and I will. <laughs> well, it's always, listen, it's always a pleasure to be with you, Boone. It really well, is. It's good. nice to see you. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.